J.H. Prynne va lire de trois euh, de ses livres, euh, ou peut-être lira-t-il trois de ses livres, je devrais dire, Refuse Collection, Two Pollen, donc deux livres très récents, et Pearls That Were, quelque chose qui remonte à un peu plus longtemps, puisqu'il date de 1999. Euh, Refuse Collection sera lu uniquement en anglais, Two Pollen sera accompagné pour partie de traduction euh, par Abigail Lang et euh, Pearls That Were, de traduction de Pierre Alféry. Alors avant d'inviter euh, J.H. Prynne à, à monter sur scène, je voudrais, parce que moi aussi j'ai travaillé un petit peu et j'ai fait une petite traduction, et, euh, et je vais vous en lire une partie. Euh, C'est une traduction d'une partie d'une conférence que Prynne a donnée en Chine, euh, puisque ça fait partie de ses nombreux intérêts. C'est la Chine, la poésie chinoise, et il y fait de, de longs séjours pour enseigner, pour rencontrer des poètes là-bas. Et un groupe de poètes et d'étudiants ont entrepris euh, l'immense tâche de traduire 101 de ses poèmes. Et il, euh, il a donné une conférence pour leur parler. Et c'est le titre de la difficulté de traduire les poèmes difficiles. Donc c'est un texte, on va dire, un peu pédagogique, pour utiliser un, un terme à la mode, sans être trop simplificateur. Et je, je voulais le lire aussi en hommage au, au travail héroïque qu'ont effectué Abigail Lang et, et Pierre Alferry, dont vous ne verrez qu'une qu partie ce soir. Il peut être utile de signaler qu'en poésie, les idées difficiles ne sont pas toujours exprimées dans un langage difficile. Par exemple, William Blake, dans ses chants d'innocence et d'expérience, s'appuie sur un langage d'une simplicité quasi enfantine, alors que sa pensée est parfois profonde et obscure. Le langage d'Emily Dickinson n'est pour l'essentiel pas difficile non plus. Il existe aussi des cas où des idées simples sont exprimées dans un, dans un langage élaboré et subtil. Tennyson écrit parfois ainsi. Mais souvent en poésie, un langage difficile accompagne une pensée difficile. Cette difficulté dans le langage étant alors partie intégrante de la structure et de la composition du poème. C'est certainement le cas des sonnets de Shakespeare, et je dois admettre que beaucoup de mes poèmes sont ainsi. Le résultat en est que mon lectorat n'est pas large et que mes traducteurs ont du pain sur la planche. Considérons quelques aspects particuliers de difficultés linguistiques du point de vue du lecteur et du traducteur non natif. Mot à mot, le long du texte, les problèmes sont d'abord lexicaux. Nous voulons retrouver les équivalences sémantiques, les idiomes, les registres de langue et les nuances stylistiques du choix des mots. Si le vocabulaire du poème multiplie les nuances de signification possibles en invoquant différents domaines d'usage spécialisés ou des allusions historiques nombreuses, le lecteur traducteur s'arrête un moment pour envisager les choix à faire. Quel chemin suivre parmi la multitude qui se présente Parfois, les possibilités sont incompatibles entre elles, et parfois, un des chemins peut, s'il est suivi, donner une nouvelle direction très particulière au reste du texte et à sa signification générale. La méthode habituelle pour contenir cette variété et cette étendue de choix sémantiques est le recours au contexte. La signification, par expression ou par phrase, a un fonctionnement autre que celui de la sémantique lexicale. Car à l'intérieur d'une communauté culturelle, les usages du discours ordinaire établissent des priorités contextuelles, préférant une signification usuelle à des combinaisons moins communes. Il s'agit de pertinence sélective au regard d'un contexte, par exemple les contraintes grammaticales, les expressions idiomatiques, la cohérence thématique. Ce sont des éléments qui rendent le discours en prose relativement rapide et facile à lire, sans trop d'hésitation sémantique on sait à peu près à quoi s'attendre d'une phrase à la suivante. Il en va autrement des poèmes, et notamment des poèmes difficiles dans une culture littéraire développée. Le niveau de lien prévisible entre une composante du texte et la suivante, ou même entre un mot et le suivant, est souvent si bas qu'il provoque en continu une forte surprise chez le lecteur et une riche incertitude devant la surcharge de possibilités de lecture. Non seulement la densité ou la condensation est-elle une caractéristique générale de la poésie, où les liens sémantiques peuvent être coupés, voire complètement absents, mais on trouve de surcroît dans les poèmes complexes une diversité de références en, appar en apparence incompatible entre elles. Le lecteur peut procéder lentement avec ce type de dense composition et enrichir son activité de lecture en marquant des pauses occasionnelles. Il n'est pas nécessaire de prendre des décisions précises à chaque fois, car l'incertitude peut être inhérente au texte, à ses connexions internes et à sa méthode de pensée. Le docteur Samuel Johnson voyait dans cette violation de la relation au contexte une faute grave dans la pratique des poètes métaphysiques anglais 
qui attelle ensemble par la violence les idées les plus hétérogènes. C'est une citation de Johnson. Mais plus tard, T.S. Eliot a fait remarquer que le télescopage des images et la multiplication des associations est souvent une source de vitalité, le matériau disparate étant astreint à l'unité par l'opération de l'esprit du poète. La poésie surprend, et un bon poème difficile peut nous surprendre au point de nous couper le souffle. Une traduction ne peut pas réussir si pour rendre un poème étranger compréhensible, elle le rend ordinaire et prévisible dans l'usage de ses mots. Ainsi, le langage employé dans la traduction d'un poème difficile et surprenant doit lui-même être difficile et surprenant. C'est dans la fréquentation intime de ces éléments logés dans la pratique d'écriture de poètes difficiles que l'on peut se rapprocher de la dynamique interne de la pensée poétique. Les relations entre pensée et signification, entre argument et questionnement, sont localisées à l'intérieur d'une expérience des structures linguistiques, mais hors des lignes régulières de la signification ordinaire. Si un lecteur ou un traducteur parvient à pénétrer l'espace textuel d'un langage employé de manière intensément non ordinaire, un poème peut révéler une part de son énergie interne, une portion de pensée poétique. On dit souvent que la poésie est ce qui se perd dans la traduction. Au contraire, il arrive au moins parfois que la poésie soit ce qui est découvert par la traduction. Bienvenue à Jeremy Prine. Merci. <coughs> This introduction makes me sound like a French poet. Maybe I am a French poet, but I never knew that. So now I do. Now I can be a grand French poet like the others and not a just a boring English poet. Voilà. At the beginning, before we commence, I have some grateful thanks to express to the Pompidou Center for arranging this visit and for their officials for being so cordial and gracious and to some individuals who have arranged everything so well, to Sarah Riggs and to Abigail Lang who has done some expert translations of the poem as you will later hear and to Omar whose first name I can pronounce approximately in the Arabic fashion but I never learned from him how to pronounce the second part of his name, and so I won't risk it. But he is Omar, I believe, in the Moroccan Arabic form, as he attempted to teach me earlier today. It is very nice to be back in Paris. Paris is certainly a wonderful city, <clears throat> and when the sun comes out, as it did this morning, in February, if you please, blue sky, bright sun, Everything was wonderful. I enjoy myself here very much. When I come to Paris, too infrequently, I make an exception about my attitude to reading publicly on an occasion like this. Very often I don't do that, not because I don't enjoy it, but because I think it creates a wrong expectation in the audience. When an audience hears <coughs> reading a <of> work, <coughs> excuse me, reading a work in the poet's own voice, they believe so readily that some special insight has been communicated to them because the poet's voice is authentic and true and inward. And so the whole mystery of the poem is presented directly to the ear of the audience. This belief is completely false in my impression, totally misguided, misleading, untrue and false. Many poets read very badly. Most poets read their work quite differently on different occasions. 
There is no fixed way of delivering in acoustic form the text of a poem, and there is no truth about such performances, only just the occasional choices made on the occasion in particular. And these auditory memories, when an audience hears a poet read, can stay with you for a lifetime. You open the text of a work that you know and admire, and immediately you hear the memory of the poet's voice, and it's an insuperable obstacle to re-encountering this poem in a new way for yourself. A really serious obstacle, and I detest to create obstacles for the freedom of the reader. But Paris is a different place. <laughs> Paris has a sophisticated culture. Paris understands these things, and so I am reasonably safe in your hands. Let me explain what is to be our plan for this evening. I hope we won't run for too long and outlast your patience, but if we outlast your patience, you must thump your feet on the floor and make it quite clear that it's gone on long enough and we should stop. <clears throat> the plan is that after a further brief introduction from me, I should read first a particular poem which has an historical relation to the rest of this evening's performance. It is not too long, but it will not be translated into French because we didn't think of this idea until quite late in the plan. But I hope it will make its effect. Then we will move to the poems in this collection called To Pollen, and I hope there will be enough time for me to read all these poems to you. Abigail has made some translations, and she will read the first five poems in her elegant French version after I have read these first five poems in English. And then after that, I will read the rest of the poems in this collection to you. Then I hope we will have a little time for Pierre Alferi to read, possibly from his own work, possibly from his translations of another collection of mine called Pearls That Were. Here it is. And he's done some extremely elegant translations of these poems, and it would be very agreeable if you could hear some of those. We will see how time goes along and what is the mood of the majority in this matter. Now, as an introduction, I want you all to be very relaxed. I want you all to feel very easy and comfortable. You are surrounded by a grand culture that is reassuringly in place for you and is constantly available to remind you about the advantages of artistic experience, a grand culture and a grand metropolis. Feel very relaxed. <laughs> now I have to tell you about an experience this morning. One of my <clears throat> reasons for coming to Paris, apart from being with you here this evening, was to have a look at some paintings by Poussin, the great Roman artist who is so deeply in love with his native land, France, of course. And one of the paintings <clears throat> that I was inspired to see this morning was a painting called The Inspiration of the Poet. It is a grand tableau. And in the centre of this extremely beguiling painting, there is the figure of the poet in the person of Apollo, with his lyre, his musical instrument upon his lap, and he's surrounded by various allegorical figures who are giving him aid in the task of composing poetry. He was, of course, the god of poetry. And there are figures presumably representing Virgil, for one. And Apollo is leaning across his front figure with his forearm, his strong and powerful forearm, pointing across to a writing tablet that the figure on his left, our right, is holding, with a pen in hand, ready to take down the inspired words of the poet. It is a wonderful image. It shows the serenity of Apollo with all his powers. We remember, because we are creatures of a later time, that when Nietzsche gave a description of the powers of the artist and of art, he described and it divided these powers into the powers of the Apollonian calm and splendour and order, 
and the Dionysiac frenzy of confusion and darkness, which was the counterpart. There is no visible evidence of this Dionysian counterpart in Poussin's picture, though perhaps it's there by a certain kind of implication. There are various figures, little putties, little Amorini, and they are carrying laurel crowns, and there are enough laurel crowns to go round for everyone. All those involved in the production of poetry shall have crowns. It's like a children's party. All the children shall have prizes. So, when Apollo plays upon his lyre, what do you think we might have heard? In Paris, in the 17th century, in Poussin's time, we would have heard something like this. I won't play it loudly, because it's played on a very soft instrument, but I hope you'll be able to hear it. Very relaxed. Close your eyes. That was <clears throat> Jacques de Gallo, Le Veu Gallo de Paris, a little bit later than Nicolas Poussin, but not much. Uh, the first track from the suite in Fa Mineur, the prelude. Very calm, very elegant, very assured. Sometimes in the life of a serious artist, it is no longer possible to be certain about the power of art. Sometimes the whole question of the power of any sort of order is completely in jeopardy. And when that occurs, any artist, or indeed any sane person, has to consider whether the order of certainty and comfort can withstand advanced moral, political, military corruption. And the poems I intend to read you this evening come from a crisis moment in my conception of the poet as artist and the ability of art to offer any kind of security in the world of serious depravity and disorder. I've never 
felt in a position of this kind before. Maybe I shan't again. But there was a particular moment that produced one poem I'm going to read you to start with, and then as a kind of follow-on consequence of that, the poems in this collection. They are not like anything I have ever written before. Ces quelques mots sont liés à la photographie d'une scène désormais inscrite au répertoire de notre temps, scène d'une criminalité destinale. Une criminalité destinale. These are the words of a notable French poet who I am proud to count as my friend and who is here tonight. We seem to have had a not dissimilar response. The event in question, now well known as an atrocity without parallel, was the revelation about the prison camp Abu Ghraib and the treatment in that prison of the captive Iraqis held there and abused and punished and seriously mutilated by their captors. This was not a usual wartime atrocity because these were entirely captive, unable to resist, unable even to represent the nature of the humiliations that were inflicted upon them. And so before even the full extent of this violence and wickedness had been revealed, I found myself writing this very unusual for me poem. I cannot even pronounce its title because its title is at least doubly equivocal. The first word of this two-word title is R-E-F-U-S-E. This can be in English either a noun, refuse, which is trash or garbage, or it can be a verb, in which case it would be an imperative, refuse. It is impossible to decide whether this poem is refuse collection or refuse collection. Probably it is both, and there is no acoustic way to deliver both these titles by a simultaneous utterance. So I explain this to you as my reason for not being able to give you the title, but I will give you the rest of this text. To a light lead soul in pit of this by slap up barter of an armrest cap on stirrup trade in crawled to many bodies uncounted. Talon up, crude oil for food, incarnidine, incarcerate, get foremost a track rocket, rapacious in heavy investment, insert tool this way up, this way, can it, will you, they took to fast immediate satisfaction or slather, new slave run, the chain store, enlisted, posture writhing, what they just want, will box tip that, nim nim. Cam shot spoilers, strap to high stakes, head to the ground, elated, detonator like a bear dancing, stripped, canny sex romp, webbing taint, confess, sell out, the self-input, yes, rape, yes, village gunship, by Apache rotor, capital, genital, grant a seed trial, take a nap, a twin. Fruiting bodies, vintage, shagged out on batch, standby, grander conceptual, gravid with feet or sweet rot, adoring placid or regular. It is we they do it, even yet, now, sodomized in a honey cell, pitted up against the good cheat, dimpled in a power cuff jersey, shrug to fit, waste for traffic, kick the door in, go on, do it, we'll photograph everything, home movies hold steady on while they is, we do it, by I it takes oozing huge debt. Reschedule, value credits, war for oil, oil for food, food for sex, molest, modest, reject, stamp on limp, abjected, lustral panoply. 
Little crosses everywhere, yours and mine. Makeshift parlour, chicken rape, private sold down DIY. There is a country. Bite off the cap with a twist. Up a strut, invest cream of profit on a visor. Bench law pressure, why would you not credit that? It is to be believed by living daylights. Voided moral defection by blank horror for terror of sacrifice. Stairway to air, drilled by fierce devotion. Say yes. Brutal finish this sentence. Go on, do it till they yelp and will rise up against us in a storm of justice. Or let's pause to redefine that, run up a treaty, sell them into so-called paradigm. Call sign freedom, Operation Sharp Knife. Finish as you never will in a heap on the ground. Prostrate, back spavined and fresh crushed, then another explosion. Flush with cash for sex, for punishment. Let's try a little execution only on mother's endorsement equity. Don't work in a high tower no more. Indwell infidel on a ranting stair. Profess exactly for take into captivity, assault and quell and kill thirsty work. Sweat running in our eyes, of course, also looting and kidnapping. So write home about it. Go on, do it. Invited spectacle, dump. Tag evil, so palpable, fungus in the nail bed, your choke on a constant program device. Die in battle, die in bed, or maybe on a trolley. Be sick and feel better. Desire even a just peace. Kick them around, shall we do it? That be sick and stamp on non-white body parts. Benchmark yields huddled up naked. Land of the free. Control, respite, deliverance. Cut off spoken abuse. Postural forensic gag reflex. Fabric whitener. You do know this. Global recovery now warming up, running on all fours as the dollar oil price rise is hedged and written down, corrupt reserves declared to win. Simulate handcuff bunker, take out the turret like dirt fuel data, vow to thee. <laughs> is that what? Snatch attack, wire hid for a circus, for venture, cap life, savings, razor cut, recruit, to strip, to sweet wince, rat garbage, trim ankle, go fetlock, to float there. Hands on, foot rack, on carotid palpitation, ravenous, lies and falsehoods, stalled, credibly usual, our watch accepted, your finger, your sacred thumb. The truth of faked report on a pulse. A bloodline stamp on whose neck, why not credit, dog kill. In the curving mirror of enlarged depravity, daily and abhorrent, a comfort of disgust adjusted to market slippage. A pact encroached, my face pouch, your puffy demonic exclusion, so far, too far. No, we know that, and never, yes, quite probable. I rape, transit, to twitch, renege on membership, limbs blazing, all out, famous by gorged access. Did you, heart attack, hear these words? Your own mouth, purse formation, broke their outline, just awaiting the chance of derangement from deep inside. An occupying force commits pillage. The sadism cut to measure from its concept of possession, own brand words rise up in some necks to stifle disbelief. Bite them down. Go on, bite them. Encircling gloom, some bright ruined spark goes for broke, power failure, online, claw back from the entrails. Ticket of leave, revulsed, Sup on this glory, this horror story, full house, endurably feel good recoil. The aghast demeanour, our shield, our family and childcare, we form a square to defend value, invest in safety, in fields of plenty, occupations gone to a rot clinic. 
privation mate leashed up, mental famine. All right, core rescue by concession of expendable defect, the option play to transference, to run hysteric barrage forward deployment, preset threat assessment at deferred base precision, risk profile vamps up by alert to stockade fire lines. If the inside is now already exposed, then crush the outside. Consider this your zone of inclusion. That's us. We don't pray heads down. We watch the target this time. Ah, yes, right, we are the target. Let's go faster now and self-abhor. Get there first. Civil defence. Rights issue. Give before robbed in store. Mutilation and self-rape. Defilement on a display promotion. Give blood shed more. Greedy, bright halo. Warranted buggery, word chewed, spittoon, upper rule of lawyers on pro rata fee commission, unnatural cruelty. Entire violation, natural and brutish. Metal restraints, standing room only, seats reserved for women in labour. Forced them. They do our will to deny what they do is ours the wanton ambit of self-possession, the tasks of self-defence. In our name, long-term marching as to a holy city ringed too close to call. Our land, ours, raw and forever.